Okay, good afternoon. I would like to share with you some uh, data on aspergillus resistance and focus more on the clinical perspective of that. So here are my disclosures, all heavenly influenced by the companies. So I want to start with three questions. And the first question is, have you ever treated or been involved in the treatment of a patient with an azole resistant infection caused um, of Aspergillus fumigatus? Oh, I had expected more no voters, but this is very good. So the next uh, question is, if you have a patient at a high risk for uh, an invasive aspergillosis, for instance, and you culture an aspergillus fumigatus, would an uh, MIC test be performed? So the first option is uh, not routinely. The second uh, is, um, is performed when ordered, is routinely performed. I don't know or I don't care. So please vote. Okay, so quite a lot of you are doing MIC testing on Aspergillus fumigatus. So may I have the next slide, please? So the question now is, what do you do with the results? So if you have a patient with a probable invasive aspergillosis, is treated with voriconazole, and you culture Aspergillus fumigatus, and the MIC is high, is eight when it comes back from the lab, <laughs> What would you do? Would you continue treatment with chloriconazole if the patient is responding? Would you add an echinocandin? Would you change to liposome after some B? Or are you the person from the other slide, your clinical decision is not influenced by MICs? Okay, so most of you would change to um, a liposome after some B, so change to another class. Next, okay. So I want to um, discuss a little bit on the background of azole resistance um, in Aspergillus, and I start with the fungus, with the phenotype. So if you think about resistance, you have two types. You have intrinsic resistance. That means that all the members of a certain species are resistant or less susceptible. So for instance, for Aspergillus lentulus, we know that the azoles are less active. Um, also, tubingensis, which was used to call Niger, we know that the azoles are less active. And on the other hand, you might have acquired resistance, what we has been documented in Aspergillus fumigatus, also um, in Aspergillus flavus, and also in Aspergillus terrius for azoles. So my idea is that actually every Aspergillus can become resistant to um, azo drugs as long as it is in the right circumstances. So I will focus mainly on Aspergillus fumigatus because I think, and on the azoles because that I think is the most um, prominent problem. So if you look at the phenotype, this is the e-test, you can see that um, when the um, isolate is resistant in vitro, then um, it will grow. Let's see. This works, it will start growing up to the strip which is loaded with the antifungal. This is for itraconazole and that's for posaconazole. So if you test a large collection of isolates, um, we did that in 952 Aspergillus fumigatus isolates, and you look at itra, you get a distribution around the wild type, and you can see that there's a second population which is actually quite far away from the susceptible one, and that is the non-wild type. For voriconazole, you can see again, you have the wild type population, but here the other population is much closer to the wild type. And for posaconazole, you have a wild type population, and then you have, appear to have two populations outside the wild type. This is closer to the wild type, and this is a small population with no activity. And actually, most isolates um, will show resistance to more than one azole and then are called multi-azole resistant. So the phenotype is characterized in the lab by a high MIC. So then we have to look at the genotype and as you know the azoles they act in, in the ergosterol biosynthesis which is then incorporated into the cell membrane.
And if you look at the target of the azoles, it is the CYP51A uh, gene. And especially in the CYP51A, there are mutations which confer azole resistance. So most resistance mechanisms are associated with CYP51A gene, but there are quite a lot which are not associated and we don't know what the resistance mechanism is. But I think up to now over 20 different mutations have been described. So what does it matter to the patient? And that's of course the question of today, the clinical implication. Well, the next step is to look at the, the preclinical data. So what happens in the efficacy of your azole if you have a, uh, a model of invasive aspergillosis? So this is a mouse model, non-neutropenic mouse model, where different isolates with different mutations were tested and the mice were treated with an azole and in this instance it was posaconazole. So these are the phenotypes. So the wild type has low MICs against the three azoles. The isolate which has this mutation, you can see high MIC for ITRA, but also non-wild type MICs for the other drugs. This one is high, high MICs for ITRA and POSA, and this mutation, high MIC for ITRA again, and 0.5 for POSA conazol. So these four isolates uh, were used to infect mice and then using dose, dose fractionation of posaconazole, the efficacy was investigated. So here you can see the survival of the mice and this is the increasing dose of posaconazole. And this is the wild type and you can see that with increasing dose, the response and the survival increases reaching 100%. However, the other isolate is down here. So you treat with the same dose fractionation and you can see that there's no activity and only at very high posaconazole concentrations there appears to be some efficacy. So this indicates that the MIC is very important for the efficacy of your drug. So what about those two other isolates which had an MIC of 0 0.5? Well, they end up exactly in between um, the wild type and the one with an MIC greater than 60. So this indicates that you need a higher concentration of posaconazole to achieve a similar efficacy to the wild type. And it also means, shows that you, even at the highest concentration, you don't achieve the same survival as with the wild type. So with azoles, it's very much to do with the relation between the total dose exposure you give to the mice in relation to the MIC. So the higher the MIC, the higher the drug exposure in your patient. And that, of course, is limited by toxicity. So if you look at voriconazole, this isolate has an MIC of 0 0.5 and this of 2. You see the same. So this is the wild type. You can see with increasing concentrations, there's increasing efficacy. And with this isolate of 2, you can see that the curve is shifted to the right. With an MIC of 2, you can see that you do achieve maximal efficacy, indicating that you get enough drug exposure if you have an MIC of 2 in this model. So actually, there are quite a lot of models which have been looking into the impact of azo resistance. And the summary is that increasing azo MIC corresponds with a loss of efficacy. Some models have looked at a combination treatment, voriconazole with anidlafungin, that was found to be synergistic in isolates which were azole susceptible. But when the MIC of voriconazole went up, then you had an additive efficacy. So you lost the synergy, but um, it still had an added value to add anidlafungin. And models which use liposomal amphotericin B actually show that it didn't make any difference if the isolate did or not have an azo resistance mutation. The efficacy was ex exactly the same against all isolates. So the preclinical data indicates actually that the MIC is important and if you have an azo resistant isolate that you might end up with treatment failure of your patients. 
So the next question is, what do we know from patients' treatment? Well, unfortunately, there are no phase three randomized controlled trials looking at the efficacy in azole susceptible and azole resistant disease. So we're down to case series, experience, and case reports. One of the problems is if you look at those case series is that there are many factors which influence the outcome. And of course, the most important is what is the status of the underlying disease. So if a patient has uh, persistent leukemia, you could even fail treatment if you have an azole susceptible isolate, and you also fail if you have an azole resistant isolate if you treat the patient with azoles. The other thing is, was the exposure of the drug sufficient in that patient? So was it measured in the patient and was it sufficient? For some uh, aspergillus diseases like CNS aspergillosis, we know that the mortality is always high. Another important factor is the timing. So was the timing of the treatment uh, appropriate? Was the patient treated early enough? If not, it would have died anyway, with an, even with an azole susceptible isolate. And also, are we certain that the azole resistant uh, isolate caused the disease in that patient? So in summary, it's very difficult in, from clinical cases to uh, determine what the implications are of azole resistance. So there are a number of case series which have reported azole resistance, and this was one from our department in 2007. And in this series, there were seven patients, and we found that many of those patients actually had a breakthrough aspergillosis. So they were on treatment with azoles, and during treatment, they failed. If you look at the underlying diseases of these patients, you can see it might be not what you expected. So there were a couple of patients who had a hematological malignancy, but most of them had other diseases. If you then look at the outcome, you can see that of the seven patients, only two died and uh, the others all survived. And you can see that some patients received voriconazole azomonotherapy and survived. This patient also voriconazole monotherapy and survived. However, there are other patients like this one who had voriconazole monotherapy and died and this patient was switched to posaconazole and also died. So it's very difficult to establish based on this case series what the implications are of a resistant isolate. Another series was, was published by the Manchester group where they looked at patients with chronic aspergillosis and they had a case uh, series of 14 patients and again there were many patients if you underline failure or no improvement. Actually, the majority of those patients showed um, some kind of failure on azoles. So there's a clear trend, I think, in the literature indicating that patients who have an azole-resistant isolate actually don't do well if they're treated with azoles. The last series I want to show you is this from a Dutch surveillance study where there were eight patients with azole-resistant invasive aspergillosis. So these patients mostly actually had hematological malignancy, so that is more in line what you would expect. So there were five patients who had invasive aspergillosis in the lung. You can see that all five of them were treated with voriconazole monotherapy, and all five had died at week 12. So this I think would be higher than you would expect if you give uh, foriconazole for invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. So there were also three patients who had also CNS involvement and only one of those survived. So from this series, seven out of eight patients with an azole resistant isolate actually died and most of them were treated with uh, azole monotherapy. So I think the message and the indication is that you have a higher probability to fail treatment um, if you have an azole resistant isolate and you are treated with azoles. So if you think about the clinical implications, I think it's very important to realize 
the two different routes of um, getting infected. And the first I would refer to as the patient route. And in that in, um, setting, patients inhale azole susceptible spores. So when um, these patients turn out to have a cavity and are treated with azoles for a long time, there is a risk of resistance developing. And the thing is that in the cavity, the aspergillus sporulates. And sporulation appears to be a very a strong enhancer of getting mutations. And actually, if you would take samples here, you would find that there are a lot of different mutations. So the fungus is able of acquiring these mutations due to the pressure of the azole therapy. So that's very different to the other route, and that is the fungicide route because then there are already resistant spores in the air the patient inhales. So we think that's due to the fact that azoles are broadly used outside medicine and one application is in agriculture. So there are five uh, compounds which have been identified which are triazoles which have activity against aspergillus and are used for all kinds of applications. So we think that in the environment, there are certain mutations which occur in Aspergillus fumigatus. The patient then inhales these spores, and because these azoles are very similar uh, based on mole molecular structure to the medical azoles, they don't work anymore. So what are the characteristics? Well, the first is that you can find azo resistance in any Aspergillus disease patients with cavity, but also without patients with invasive aspergillosis, they can have an azole-resistant isolate. Also, we found in surveillance studies that two-thirds of patients who have an invasive aspergillosis due to an azole-resistant isolate have never been treated with azoles before. Also, we find that the, they, they have mixed infections with both susceptible and resistant aspergillus fumigators. And also, there are a limited number of specific mutations in the isolates. So, surveillance studies in the Netherlands show that um, in the different hospitals, in our hospital here in Nijmegen, 4.9% of the isolates we culture from patients are actually azole resistant. But there are other centers like here in Leiden, which is here, where nearly 20% of the isolates which they culture from patients are azole resistant. There are also some recent studies in Belgium, a nationwide study, where 5.5% of isolates were azole resistant, and a very recent study in Turkey where they found 10.2%. So the first isolate they found was actually in the year 2000, and it will be published in 2015. So it's 15 years later that they actually discovered that 10% of the isolates were azole resistant. In the US, however, um, it has not been detected in the environment. In the UK, also, um, there's only one study which indicates resistance through the environment, and this was by the Manchester group, where they find this aspergillus fumigators with these mutations um, in the environment. So, in our country, the environmental route is very important, causing 80% of azole-resistant diseases. In Belgium and also in Turkish study, it was also in a high proportion. So if you have an environment, envir environmental route of resistance, it's usually very dominant. In our center, we had 4.9% last year. We found that there were 15 patients who were culture positive and had an invasive aspergillosis. Four of those turned out to have an azole-resistant isolate, which is 26%. All of them died compared to 45.5% with a susceptible isolate. In the ICU in uh, Leiden University, they did a study over three years, 146 patients, 38 were culture positive with aspergillus fumigatus. 10 out of those, out of 38, 26% were azole resistant. Again, all of them died, but also the fatality rate 
um, in the susceptible was very high. So I want to finish with two examples of these two routes of resistance development. The first one is a, a patient with CJD who was admitted in 2011, and he had a l very long history of problems with Aspergillus infection. So here he, he had an invasive aspergillosis um, on the clavicular sternal joint, and also he had an aspergilloma in the lung, which was confirmed by our radiologist. So if we looked at this patient over time, we were unable to control his infection, and ultimately he died, and we kept on culturing aspergillus fumigators. If you then look at all the treatments he had, you can see that there was a lot of switching, first POSA, then ITRA, VORI, caspofungin, liposomal amphotericin B, vanilla fungin, all these combinations. If you then look what happens to the isolates, this is what happened. So this is the first isolate, and this is over time. You can see that very soon, ITRA has no activity at all. Then the next step is that POSA has no activity at all. And finally, you see that voriconazole has an MIC of 8. And even isoviconazole, which is not yet licensed in the Netherlands, it's fully resistant. So this is an extreme azole-resistant isolate. So through switching of azoles in these patients, you get this accumulation of resistance mutations and you end up with an extreme azole-resistant isolate. And I think that happens not only in antifungal drugs, but also, for instance, in the host defense. You have peptides with antifungal activity. And this fungus is adapting all this time to the stress factors. So when the, these patients get an aspergillus infection, the probability, probability of eradication decreases over time because the fungus keeps on adapting to its environment and the probability of persistence actually increases. The fungicide route, I will show an example of a patient who actually in our hospital now was a 71-year-old male who uh, recently received a kidney transplant and he was on immune suppression. So he was brought to the ICU for bronchoscopy and uh, he had a, a, a respiratory infection. So in the BEL, the Galactomanon was six. We cultured over 20 colonies of SP fumigators and also CMV was positive and also his serum Galactomanon was six. So this is a patient with a probable invasive aspergillosis, and we routinely screened four colonies for azole susceptibility, and they were all azole susceptible, and this is the MICs. So we treated this patient with voriconazole, and because the patient is on the ICU, bronchial aspirates are collected twice a week. So after 10 days, one of the bronchial aspirates had two colonies of aspergillus fumigators. And these were both azole resistance according to our screening test. So when we did an MIC, we found that the MIC for Vori was greater than 60. So the patient had adequate, adequate levels and was improving, and we continued voriconazole. But the next sample we ob obtained looked like this. So there were more than 20 colonies we cultured, and we analyzed all 20 colonies. And we found that 18 were voriconazole resistant and two were susceptible. So I believe that this patient on admission had mainly susceptible isolates, but made a few resistant. And through to the vori pressure, um, it reversed to uh, voriconazole resistant. So the patient was then treated with voriconazole and anilofungin, and the treatment is still ongoing. But the question is, what does this mean in this patient? He is slowly improving. How are we going to eradicate this fungus from this patient? So I want to close with um, the results of an expert meeting we had in October 2013, how to manage patients at risk for azole-resistant invasive aspergillosis. So if you have a patient who is at risk and you have a probable invasive aspergillosis, you usually start with voriconazole. If the culture is positive, then the experts thought, well, you have to do an MIC. If you want to start antifungal treatment, 
if you are in a region where azo resistance is present in the environment, you have to do it rapidly, test multiple colonies, and also determine the resistance mechanism. If it's azo susceptible, you continue for iconosol. If it's azo resistant, then most of the experts would switch to liposomal amphotericin B. However, they would consider alternative options, but they would all avoid azo monotherapy. The more difficult question is, if you live in an area where you know there is resistance in the environment, how do you manage that? And at what percentage of resistance do you decide to change your primary treatment strategy? And the experts felt that if it is above 10%, then you should change the uh, strategy. And most of them fav favored either liposome amphotericin B or voriconazole with an atinocandin uh, combination. Of course, they had their number of factors which need to be uh, considered in making that choice. So in conclusion, I think that um, azo resistance is a clinical problem in aspergillus fumigators and it really reduces the treatment success, the probability of treatment success. If a patient has a cavity and chronic azo therapy, that's a clear risk for developing uh, resistance. And I think in the fungicide route of azo resistance, I think that is a major route of resistance if you live in an area where it's found in the environment. And that would require intensive monitoring of patients who are treated for invasive aspergillosis and also routine in vitro susceptibility testing. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you.